<laughs> All right, here we are again for another uh, another installment of Thursday morning Bible study. We will probably finish the book of James today, probably. <clears throat> uh, we're ready for James chapter 5, um, verse 12. <clears throat> Just to remind you of everything we've covered so far in James 5, um, a couple weeks ago we talked about the rich oppressors, um, how, uh, how it's probably the believers that are being uh, subjugated and taken advantage of, uh, ridden roughshod over by the wealthy and powerful. <clears throat> we talked about being patient in suffering. Um, uh, a little bit about perseverance and how we want to uh, to keep hanging on, clinging to Jesus until he returns, no matter what we face. Uh, and that brings us here to, uh, to verse 12. <clears throat> verse 12 seems to be sort of an outlier. Uh, like, it, it doesn't really seem like it goes with the stuff above. It's not clear that it goes with the stuff below. It just seems like it's kind of stuck in there. <clears throat> so let's just read verse 12 and then we'll, uh, we'll tear it apart. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. Uh, you might have something like, let your yes be yes, and your no, no, or you'll be condemned. <clears throat> um, again, uh, it, it's hard to see exactly how this ties in, ties in with everything else, but I think that it probably does. Um, in the NIV, the first two words are, above all. Okay, so that kind of seems like when you, when you make that kind of a statement, if you're just talking to somebody, what does that normally indicate? Everything you've already spoken of. There's no specific important thing, just general conversation. Maybe. I don't know. I'm trying to go to the above all. <coughs> it almost indicates there was a list given. And this goes on top of the list. Yeah. So, um, you know, get ready to, to leave for the, the morning. The kids are home. There are things that you want them to do. You need to feed the cat and the dog. Uh, you need to water the llama and the chickens. Uh, you need to get your laundry picked up. But above all else, you really need to listen to your mother. Because if I find out otherwise, it's going to get ugly. Above all, what's really the most important in that long list of things? The last one. It, it is above everything else. Okay, so let's, uh, above all, what are we supposed to do? Or not do? Don't swear. Don't press. Don't press. Don't oppress. Yeah. Like the rich people uh, were uh, oppressing the, not the people below them. Okay. The, the wealthy and the powerful people were oppressing most likely just everyday ordinary followers of Jesus. Let's think for a minute about uh, the previous four and a half chapters. How many times has James given some kind of instruction that has to deal with your mouth or your vocabulary or your speech? Local language, self-control. <clears throat> James chapter 3 is all about your tongue. You praise God and you curse one another with the same mouth. That shouldn't ought to be. 
don't do it. There have been some <clears throat> some other uh, other things. Uh, sort of, I, I guess, back in chapter one, uh, if you if you lack wisdom, you should ask God. Um, so there's some instruction about prayer. Um, there there are some some. This is kind of like the very short series of speech admonishments. James has given some instruction to the people about how they use their mouths. And it seems like this is the, the big one. I suppose if we if we try to pick some things apart a little bit more, we could look at the, the beginning of chapter five where there is the oppression uh, and then probably some of that has oppression and persecution has come as a result of of speech you know people making false accusations um, people ridiculing or mocking humiliating those who are following Christ <clears throat> I, I suppose there's probably some room um, for that in between the lines um, backbiting backbiting showing favoritism oh you come and sit over here why don't you Go back in the corner somewhere. <clears throat> um, finding fault, chewing on each other, uh, and so here, um, halfway through the last chapter, James says, "Above all, more more than any of these other things, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else." Okay, let's make sure we understand first of all what swearing is. Swearing is not dropping the four-letter words um, in vocabulary as we have a conversation. Not this particular instance. We're not supposed to use vulgar, coarse language. Um, we're, we're supposed to use things that build up and encourage one another, godly speech. Um, things that overflow out of a purified cleansed, forgiven heart um, that is the residence of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so don't believe that because I say this is not about cursing, cussing, um, using bad language that you get to. That's not the truth either. Okay, Those words will still get you in trouble. But the specific thing that um, James is writing about here is about making oaths taking vows, making promises, which some people would use um, and include God in. For example, uh, if you go uh, as a witness <clears throat> in a court trial, you go up to the stand, and at least in one portion of our history, you would put your hand on the Bible, you would raise your right hand, and you would swear to tell the truth, whole truth, and above truth, tell me God. Sure. You you make that you make that vow. I'm going to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Now. Yeah, isn't that funny? <clears throat> I always thought it was oh. Way we frivolous, but oh my god, oh my god, using God, I know. Well, I probably I it, was... it would probably include that. That's using His name in vain in an yeah. empty, meaningless way. Yes, empty. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, I didn't think it was. That's probably words. part of the reason why James gives this direction, because God's name is special. Mm -hmm. and holy and is not to just right. be thrown around in every other uh, word in a sentence okay <clears throat> um, so like uh, well let's go with you know sort of some sort of ridiculous illustration okay we'll go back to the kids chore list okay um, you know number one this is your job you need to go and uh, you need to mow the yard today. Number two, uh, you need to do the trimming. Number three, you need to wash the dog. Um, okay, you gonna do it? Yes, Dad. 
I promise, I swear, oh. and with God as my witness, I will take care of the lawn. That's kind of the thing that James is aiming at, because it is not something that necessarily requires the, the backup testimony of Almighty God. Let's not include him in things that are so trivial, common, everyday, ordinary. There, there's, no, there's no reason to do it. There's no benefit in it. And it takes something which is special and holy and exalted, and it, it, it drains it of that special quality. Okay? Um, and, okay, so... God, uh, Dad, I promise you, uh, as God is my witness, I will mow the yard. And you come home, and guess what? The yard hasn't been mowed. So what have you done with the special holy name of God? Defamed it. Well, you've defamed it, and you have also now attached it to failure. You've attached it to a lie. You said that because God was your witness, you would mow the yard, and you didn't. So now you have sucked God into your lazy sluggardliness. Let's make sure that we keep God where he belongs, on the throne of the universe, and not involved in making dinner or picking up the groceries or even things that are a little bit more significant. <clears throat> we shouldn't swear to anything. Is that what you're saying? Well, I definitely not use God's it, name when we do it. it. It seems like that the people were taking oaths, making vows like that. I absolutely pray, I absolutely promise on a stack of God's holy word that I'm going to take care of this. Or I, I, abs I, in front of God and his angels and all of the creatures of heaven, I'm telling you this is the truth. That's the thing I think that has been going on. And maybe that's how it's related to the passage ahead of it a little bit. If, if people have been doing that, taking oaths, including God and his creation, um, to convince people that a statement's true, James says, stop it. You don't need to make an oath to convince somebody of the truth. Uh, we're, su uh, we're supposed to be honest in all the things that we say because, not because of, of including God's holy name as like an exclamation point at the end of a sentence, but because we're followers of Christ Jesus, all of our words ought to be trustworthy and true, right? If we say we're going to do something, it's our intention that we're going to do it. And because we've promised that we will, we should. Um, James is not condemning the taking of vows, like wedding vows. He's not saying that we shouldn't ever do that. In the company of God and th these witnesses, I make my vow to you, love, honor, cherish, till death do us part. I don't believe that James is saying that we shouldn't take vows. I believe what he is directing us is, um, is a little deeper than that, that it is not necessary for God's people to sort of try to emphasize the truth by including God's name in it, because we ought to always be truthful. <clears throat> Um, if Christ is your Lord, then everything that you say should be able to be believed and trusted. Now, obviously, there are times when we're kidding, we're telling a joke, wink, wink, nod, nod, kind of thing. There's probably nothing wrong with a little humor like that. But when we're engaging in conversation, if, because we're a follower of Christ Jesus, there should be no expectation other than if we say something, it's the truth. If we say something, we mean it. Uh, have you, you all, uh, uh, remember Horton Hears a Who? Yeah. 
the Dr. Seuss book, The Elephant, mm -hmm. he finds the little clover in the field and there's this little tiny voice that comes out of it. I mean, one of the things that, uh, that jumps out of that book at me is one of the things that, that Horton says, I'll probably get it wrong. Um, I said what I meant and I meant, I meant what I said and I said what I meant, an elephant's faithful 100%, something like that, okay? <clears throat> That's the way that the followers of Christ should always be. There should be never be a question that if we say we're going to do something, that we'll do it. Or if we say that something is the truth, that we'll do that. <clears throat> um, uh, let's flip back a little bit to what Jesus says about the same kind of thing in Matthew chapter 5. So we shouldn't have to swear to anything because our... We should be known to be so honest, right? Well, there's no reason for us to swear. We just are you, are you a follower yes of Jesus? No. Yes. Yes? Well, then that's good enough for me. Right. Um, another uh, cultural reference. In the movie Hook with Robin Williams, he's Peter Pan. Uh -huh. The thing that Robin Williams keeps telling his son is... My word is my bond. And unfortunately, he keeps breaking it every time he uses that sentence. Like, stop using those words. I know you probably want to, you aim to, but it's not really something that means something to you. Stop saying that because all you do is remove uh, trust and faith in your abilities as a father to follow through. If you're a believer, it should automatically be true that your word is your bond. Uh, Matthew 5, 34 to 37, Jesus uh, is talking in the Sermon on the Mount about oaths. Again, you have heard it said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. That's, that seems pretty clear. I'm assuming that James has heard this teaching. And maybe that's one of the reasons why he includes it. Again, the flippant use of God's name to, to guarantee the truth of something is not necessary for the followers of Christ. We don't want to diminish his name. We don't want to bring him into our failure or our sinfulness. So let's leave him out of it and just do what we say and say what we mean. If we're going to wear the name of Christ, we should wear it the right way. He's pretty good, except he, he's a liar. Well, he is the pastor, so that's kind of disappointing. We don't, we don't, we don't want to hear about a, a pastor who tells lies or who breaks promises. <coughs> we don't want to hear about church members who are constantly fudging on business deals or letting things fall by the wayside because they... Either they didn't mean it in the first place or they just got too busy and it wasn't that much of a priority. <clears throat> if we're going to wear the name of Christ, we had better act like it. We need to act like him. Okay? James, in the uh, Air Force Chief's Creed, part of it is, my word is my bond. Oh, yeah? That's a that's a really big statement. That that's a pretty significant declaration. What I say, you can absolutely bank on. I, I will absolutely do it. <clears throat> Any other deep thoughts or questions? When I was uh, uh, interviewing for work uh, in 
the area of customer service, it would ask me what customer service means to me. And uh, my response was always integrity is priority, number one. Followers of Christ should have integral lives. Um, integrity means that it holds together, right? If I use my disintegrating ray, I'm disintegrating you, I'm making all of your pieces come apart. Integrity is that everything holds together. Your attitude and your actions, um, your, your words, everything is is connected and um, inseparable. <clears throat> That's really what uh, what this paragraph here, verse twelve, seems to be about: is um, integrity of our words, integrity of our lives as followers of Christ. Okay, we're ready to move on. I just had something hit me. Uh, it, uh, just came up my If you're doing a puzzle and you have one piece missing, you cannot complete that puzzle. So if you haven't followed through on your word, you have not. You cannot complete that. Word. There's a piece missing. There's a piece missing. That is a fair point. All right, friends. Well, let's move on to the last big piece of the Book of James. <clears throat> <clears throat> Verse 13, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them stay home in quarantine. No. <laughs> Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. That's probably good enough. We'll, we'll get to the Elijah part here in a little bit. <clears throat> okay, so um, if we are in some kind of trouble, what should we do first? We should pray. Call and get on the prayer chain. Yes. <laughs> call and get on the prayer chain so other people can pray too. Yeah. Oh, yes. Give, call Rose. Um, rather than making ridiculous oaths or getting disgusted in the face of trouble, persecution, that would be the kind of the connection up a couple of sections in James, rather than those things, we need to patiently pray. We need to trust God. Patience comes from Him. Um, one of the definitions of prayer is the way that we get we, what we need from God. <clears throat> um, it is always a, a declaration of need. <clears throat> so if, if we're not in trouble, and I, I believe uh, the, the word trouble there goes back up to verse 10. Um, patience in the face of suffering. The word for suffering is the same word that's used down here where they translate it trouble. Is any of you suffering uh, in, in whatever sense? whether it's at the hands of some wealthy, powerful oppressor, or at the hands of your idiot brother, or your rotten children, or a pig of a boss, or whatever it is. However you're suffering, facing difficulty and trouble, James says that person should pray. Being disadvantaged, being ostracized, being mistreated, our response is not not trying to get revenge, not trying to embarrass somebody else. James says that our move is to pray. Not worry. 
pray and not worry. We don't know exactly what to do in the face of trouble. We're lacking something. Wait, that reminds me. James 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. Oh, seems to be a little bit of the bridge here. If we are facing things that we don't know how to face, we're not sure what our best move is, then we should pray. We should ask God to give us what we need to, to see our way through the issue, to give us the patience that we need to endure it. God has promised that he will give us wisdom. We know that he'll give us strength. If he won't deliver us from it, he will at least comfort us through the difficulty that comes. Well, that's, if he won't deliver us through it, he will give us the, the strength, the grace, the comfort, the encouragement that we need. Because that, but that's really what we usually pray for. Oh man, things are so hard. Yeah. This is the worst part of my life ever. Lord, deliver me, rescue me. By five o'clock. <laughs> if you would, please. I have things to do. Yeah, we, we, we pray for deliverance, but sometimes right. God shouldn't do that because it's only, uh, it's only in the crucible of pain or suffering or difficulty that we actually are purified and strengthened and made better than what we were before. So, if God's not going to lift us up out of the, whatever it is, the circumstances, he will always give us wisdom and strength and encouragement, uh, the, the, whatever it is we need to get through whatever that trial may be. I think that kind of goes back, you know, like we're in this rage of, having a lot of physical issues mm -hmm. and a lot of times operation, the recovering from those. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to be patient because you want to be up at about have. time to be sick. I know. Right. So, I mean, I, that's, you know, all those things like that. I mean, I have a hard time being patient with my body not reacting like I want it as fast. Like it did when you were 20? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I got more time to be patient, but it's probably harder. <laughs> I agree with you. Have more time. Yeah, if, more time. But if we no. face trouble, persecution, suffering, crisis, whatever we face, whatever we're in the middle of, James says number one first move is pray. Pray. And number two, call Rose. <laughs> and then call the elders. Get it, get it on the prayer chain. It really does work, doesn't it, Jerry? I really believe in the prayer chain. Absolutely. You know? And so do 114 other people, give or take. That number changes a little pray. bit. I know. Yep. Up and down. How many, pray? How many open the email? That's yeah. the real question. That number is not near as much as it ought to be. That's sad. And I think, like, oh, are you even to that point yet? Yeah, the anointment's oil? Not yet. I'm not there yet. But we'll get there soon. Have patience. Okay, so if you're, if you're having trouble, I don't think he's going to cover us. Let it? him pray. But if you're happy, praise. Sing. sing songs of praise. Honor God for the good things that he has given. Don't just call God when you need something. The next thing. He knows what you need. He knows before you ask what you need. He wants you to talk to him when you have a problem. But he doesn't always only want you to call him when you have a problem, right? Right. You got a kid that, always, you know, the only time you hear from him is when they need the car fixed or a little extra money for rent or what are you going to fix for my birthday dinner, mom? Or can we come over for Thanksgiving week? <laughs> It's never just calling to see how you're doing, what's on the list for today, just thinking about you, missing you a little bit today, Mom. We love to hear from our kids all the time. 
not just when there's a crisis. Sharing praise is also a good thing to do, not keeping it to yourself. It encourages other people. That is true. Sharing praise about the things that God is doing, testifying to his goodness is important. We need to see God as more than a genie in a bottle. There it is. There it is. There it is. Let's praise him for the good that he is and the good that he does. Okay, and then he goes back to praying when there's a problem. Okay, you're in, you're in crisis, you're in trouble, you pray. Everything is great and wonderful, you praise God. If you're sick, here's what you should do. Well, first of all, you should pray because you're in crisis. But then you should also call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Okay. Um, who are the elders? Who are elders? What are they in the, in the New Testament? Uh, 